I'm so old that I have to struggle to see anything, so the reading glasses are very important. Part of that sentence in the, uh, in the introduction was supposed to be that I started covering women's issues back in the 70s, which goes to show you how long it's been. A few weeks ago, I was asked to speak at a conference on opting back into the workplace. I think this is actually better without them. That was held in New York City. The women attending the program had all left their jobs to stay home with their children, but they were now interested in returning to work, and most of them were very uncertain about how to accomplish this. Some of them knew they wouldn't be able to return to what they'd been doing before they had kids. Others didn't want to go back to their previous careers. They had never found work they loved in the first place, and they were hoping to do something different. Most of the women were interested in reinventing themselves in one way or another, but they didn't really know how to go about it, and they were looking for guidance. I was scheduled to speak on the second day of the three-day conference, but when I arrived, the director of the event took me aside and whispered urgently, I need to tell you something. We have a really big problem. What she told me was very sad. The subject on the opening day had been how to prepare for your job search. A series of speakers had encouraged the women to think about their interests, their skills, and their goals in order to figure out how to pursue employment possibilities effectively. It seems like simple common sense to consider what you want in a job and what you have to offer, but those suggestions had apparently caused total panic among many of the participants. These women are so frightened, the conference director told me. They see the challenge as being so intimidating that we're having a terrible time getting them to focus on any of the practical steps they need to take. They're so scared that they're giving up before they even get started. This sense of despair was painfully apparent to me. After my talk, most of the women bought my book, The Feminine Mistake, and asked me to sign it. But don't sign it to me, one woman said, looking as if she were about to cry. It's too late for me. My situation is hopeless. Sign it to my daughter so she won't mess up her life the way I've messed up mine. This woman was only in her mid-40s, but her diminished sense of self-worth is all too common among full-time homemakers, according to sociologists who have studied the opting out phenomenon. When you've been a stay-at-home mom for years, it can seem very difficult to figure out how and where you might fit into the workplace, which may have changed dramatically since the last time you held a paying job. The result is that many women do just give up. Some were ambivalent about returning to work anyway, and it didn't take much to discourage them. Some have genuinely tried to get back into the labor force but others are so daunted by the fear of rejection that they don't even try very hard before they throw up their hands and conclude that they will never succeed. Of course, some people don't have the luxury of giving up. Women who have been divorced or widowed or whose husbands are unemployed often find themselves compelled by financial need, and many of them do persevere in their job quest until they get back in the game. But when you've still got a husband to support you and you're not driven by necessity, it can seem a lot easier just to stay home, even if you're no longer feeling satisfied by that lifestyle. I know that many of you here today find yourselves somewhere along that journey of opting out, staying home, and then thinking about getting back into the workplace. The reason I'm here today is to talk about why it is vital for most women to work for pay outside the home and to encourage all of you not to give up on accomplishing that goal, no matter how many doubts you have or how many obstacles you find in your path. If you persevere, I can promise that you will be very glad that you managed to reestablish an independent identity, a purpose outside of the family, and an income of your own, particularly as you get older. Those of you who manage to find meaningful work that's well suited to your abilities will discover that it can nourish you for the rest of your life. I've done an enormous amount of research on the reasons why, and I'd like to share some of them with you. The bad news is that when women give up their financial self-sufficiency to become full-time homemakers, 
They are gambling their entire futures on one roll of the dice. Unless you're an heiress, depending on a husband to support you is a very risky proposition. And over time, most women will ultimately lose that bet for one reason or another. For them and for their children, the consequences are likely to be serious. Approximately half of these women will eventually get divorced, and mothers typically pay a far higher price for divorce than fathers do. Women's standard of living drops by 36% when their marriages are disrupted, whereas men's standard of living actually rises by 28%. When stay-at-home wives get divorced, they usually expect some kind of support, but many women don't realize how much has changed in recent years as a result of the equality revolution in the law. It used to be that a displaced homemaker, as they were called back in the 1970s, might be awarded long-term or even lifelong alimony. But today's courts regard women as the equal of men, and they're likely to tell the wife that she's responsible for taking care of herself. Legal experts describe the current trend as so-called rehabilitative alimony. A woman might get two or three years of limited support and then be told, you're on your own. This can come as a terrible shock to a wife who has devoted herself to home and family, particularly if she doesn't even have a viable career that she could return to. Many women also assume that the laws on child support will protect their kids in case of divorce, but this is rarely the case. The majority of custodial parents are women, but most of these mothers are not receiving the money that has been awarded to them by the courts. Almost 70 percent, that's 70 percent, of all child support cases in this country are in arrears. Nearly a quarter of all custodial mothers received no child support payments whatsoever in the last year. Many women don't have the financial resources to keep pursuing their ex-husbands for the support they were supposed to get, so they just give up. But divorce is only one of the potential challenges. Many women have to cope with their husband's illness or disability. According to current estimates, one out of every four Americans will be incapacitated at some point in their lives by substance abuse alone. A startling number of women also have to endure a husband's premature death. The average age of widowhood in America is only 54, and very few families have enough life insurance to support a non-working wife for another 40 years after her breadwinner dies. At this stage in life, women are also increasingly unlikely to remarry. By the time, by the time they reach the age of 60, two-thirds of American women do not have partners. This state of affairs represents an enormous change from previous eras. A hundred years ago, when a woman was likely to die at 39 while giving birth to her fourth or fifth child, it wasn't necessarily a bad bet to assume that your husband would support you for the rest of your life. But the female lifespan has more than doubled since then, and a third of today's women are expected to live into their 90s. The New York Times reported recently that a woman today can anticipate living an average of 13 years longer than their mothers did. My mother is 84, which puts me at 97 and counting. I've worked throughout my adult life, but I still find the idea of having to provide for my financial survival to the age of 97 or more to be absolutely terrifying. Middle-aged women often joke about their fears of being destitute and eating cat food in old age, but such fears are no joke. Twice as many women currently end up in poverty in their later years compared with men. Even more alarming is the fact that four out of five of those women were not poor while they still had husbands around. This is not some permanent underclass of poor people. This is middle class women who depended on a husband to support them, lost the husband, and found that they were destitute. Those figures are expected to rise if the current trend of women giving up paid work continues. But even if your husband doesn't divorce you or die, 
His income is far from guaranteed. Today's labor market is very insecure. The headlines are full of news about, news about business institutions in crisis and layoffs in the workforce. Many men lose their jobs at one point or another, and families that depend on a single breadwinner are much more vulnerable to economic hardship and collapse than two-income families. My family learned this the hard way, like many others. When I started writing The Feminine Mistake, I was motivated purely by journalistic goals. I felt strongly that women who give up work to stay home were not being adequately informed about the long-term consequences of economic dependency, which I've referred to as the classic feminine mistake, and they were also not being informed about the benefits of work. But I never expected that I myself would become an object lesson on these issues. Life is full of unexpected challenges. My husband was very happy in his job as a magazine editor when the principal investor for the magazine suddenly decided to shut it down. With no warning, my husband found himself out of a job a week before Christmas. He received one week's severance pay. As a 50-something white male working in an industry that is overwhelmed by layoffs and downsizing, journalism is not in good shape these days, his job prospects looked grim. At the time, both of our kids were in private school, our daughter was applying to college, and we were facing the prospect of even larger tuition bills than we were already paying. It took my husband six months to find an appropriate full-time job with the health insurance we needed. If I had been a stay-at-home mother, we might easily have had to sell our home or disrupt our daughter's plans to go to an Ivy League college in order to survive. But I was able to support our family until my husband got reestablished. So what could have been a disaster was only a temporary inconvenience. Most of us go through life thinking that bad things only happen to other people. And when you're young, the challenges that arise over the course of most people's lives often seem particularly unreal. But as you get older, you realize that very few people escape bad luck of one kind or another as time goes on. Many women simply don't do the math, but if you add up all the risk factors, it quickly becomes clear that the majority of women who give up their financial independence will eventually find themselves on the wrong side of the odds for one reason or another. When I finished writing The Feminine Mistake, I gave it to a friend who was a classic suburban soccer mom. She finished reading it at the soccer field and she called me as soon as she got home. I was at the game with four women, she said. Two of us are divorced. Our husbands left us for younger women. One of us was widowed. Her husband, the vegan runner, dropped dead last year at the age of 49. Only one of us is still married. Then I went home and I ran into my next door neighbor who told me that her husband had just announced that he's been in love with someone else for many years and he's leaving their marriage. He chose her 50th birthday to tell her this. My neighbor hasn't worked in 18 years and she has no idea how to get a job. This woman, whose own husband chose their 11th wedding anniversary to tell her that he was leaving her for somebody he had met at his AA meeting, lives in an affluent suburb, but even there, she said, women are getting completely screwed. I tell you, it's carnage out here. She herself had a stellar career that she put on the back burner after she had three children. She worked part-time over the next few years, trying to stay connected with her field, but she was still unable to get another full-time job after her husband left. He married this younger woman and started a new family. Unfortunately, he does not keep up with his child support payments to my friend and her children, and she doesn't have enough money to keep pursuing him through the courts. At last count, he owed her $95,000, which didn't stop him from going on an expensive two-week ski vacation in Steamboat Springs last month with his new family. My friend has already sold the McMansion she used to live in and downsized her family's lifestyle as much as she can, but she still can't pay the bills. She lies awake wondering how she can support herself for the next 30 or 40 years, not to mention how she's going to pay for her children's college education, which her ex-husband refuses to finance despite the fact that their divorce settlement requires him to do so. 
This woman has spent the last 11 years trying to find a full-time job in her former field, and she has not been successful. Her experience is all too common. Two-thirds of women who quit their careers to raise children are trying to re-enter professional life and finding it very difficult, according to the Center for Work-Life Policy at Columbia University, which has researched the difficulties of opting back in. The barriers to re-entry include sexism and ageism, as far as I could tell from my interviewing uh, employers and management recruiters and labor force experts, 40 is for women, what 50 or even 55 is for men in terms of ageism. A strong bias against women who have opted out and also overt discrimination against mothers. The so-called mommy factor is well documented. If you send two women with equal credentials and experience on a series of job interviews, the woman who is not a mother will receive more job offers and higher rates of pay than the woman who is a mother. This is shocking and reprehensible, but it's a reality. Three quarters of women who have opted out eventually do return to work in some capacity, but only a quarter of them manage to find full-time jobs with benefits. And without benefits, many formerly affluent women can't even get health insurance for themselves and their children. My teeth are rotting because I can't afford to go to the dentist, one woman I interviewed told me. The longer you stay out of the labor force, the harder it is to get back in. But even a brief time out inflicts a heavy financial penalty. Women lose nearly 40% of their earning power when they spend as little as three years out of the workforce. We all know that marriage is an economic partnership, but as one of the experts I quoted in my book put it, marriage is not an equal economic partnership because women assume nearly all of the economic risk. When a woman quits work to take care of the children and home, she frees her husband from domestic responsibilities so he can concentrate on his job and earning a living. But if they get divorced later on, the husband walks away with the family's major asset, which is his career. His earnings potential has been enhanced by his wife's sacrifice, whereas her earnings potential has been seriously and probably permanently curtailed. And yet, when women become full-time homemakers, our culture smiles approvingly at them for doing so. American girls are raised on a steady diet of fairy tales. By the time girls are two and a half, and I'm as guilty as the next mother of a daughter, we give our girls the Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and Little Mermaid tapes, all of which predispose them to believe that Prince Charming will eventually come along and take care of them. The Disney Princess line sold more than $4 billion worth of product last year. By the time girls are in middle school, they're reading the so-called chick lit books. By the time they're teenagers, they're going to the chick flick movies, and it's all about finding Mr. Right. Whether women realize it or not, many of their most important adult choices are guided by these assumptions. In interviewing young women, I found that the more sophisticated and well-educated they were, the more likely they were to deny that they'd been influenced by the Prince Charming mythology. And yet, in the next breath, they would say that they planned to give up their careers and stay home as soon as they had children. When I asked about the risks of economic dependency, they were invariably shocked. They had never even realized that such risks existed. But it's absolutely crucial for women to educate themselves about those realities. The way things stand now, many women give up their careers and stay home without understanding the long-term consequences of that decision. So my first message today is that economic dependency is a dangerous gamble for women over the long run, one that subjects their children to enormous risks. That's the bad news, which is certainly compelling. But to me, the good news about women and work is even more striking, and it often gets overlooked in the endless wrangles over the mommy wars. Many women believe that if their husbands earn enough money so the wives don't have to work out of economic necessity, there's no other reason to do so. And yet the benefits of work are intellectual, emotional, psychological, creative, and social, as well as monetary. 
Work gives women an independent identity and a crucial source of positive reinforcement outside the home, something that becomes very appealing when your kids get to be teenagers, whereupon they suddenly go from thinking you're perfect to thinking that everything you say or do is incredibly annoying. We all know that it's crucial for children to grow up, assert their own autonomy, and leave the nest. But that doesn't make it any less painful for a mother to graduate from being the center of her children's universe to being largely irrelevant. My daughter went off to college this year, and my son turned 16 last week. He is very busy with his own life, and he tends to give monosyllabic answers to parental questions. At this age, most male adolescents are approximately as enthusiastic about having heart-to-heart -heart conversations with their parents as they are about having their teeth drilled for root canal. If I didn't have my own career to keep me occupied, I'd be feeling pretty bereft these days. But work gives you your own social network, which continues to expand instead of contracting as your kids get older. Work provides intellectual and creative challenges that give you ongoing opportunities to excel, to expand your abilities, and to experience the tremendous exhilaration of exploring your full potential. Work also gives women leverage within their marriages and power in the larger world. A woman who can support herself has all the options that money can provide, including the freedom to leave an unhappy marriage or an abusive spouse. Working women can also elevate their family's standard of living in ways that substantially improve their children's futures. In addition to providing their families with greater financial security, working women can offer their children educational opportunities that might otherwise be impossible. Working mothers are very often accused of being selfish materialists, but most of the ones I know are working to help pay the bills and maybe send their children to college not to buy designer handbags and luxury vacations. These contributions give most of us a powerful sense of pride in our own accomplishments, one that contributes significantly to our overall sense of well-being, particularly as we get older. In this culture, women are socialized not to brag. That's the male model. It's okay to boast about success if you're Donald Trump, but women aren't supposed to talk about it. And yet the truth is that it's very gratifying to make money, to be successful, to be good at what you do, and to get recognition for your work. And women have as much right to all those rewards as men do. As a result, social scientists have documented some truly dramatic differences between working women and full-time homemakers. In virtually every important way, these differences completely contradict the prevailing cultural stereotypes about what makes women happy. The media love to talk about the stress of the juggling act between work and family, but the truth is that working women are considerably happier than stay-at-home mothers, according to a very large body of social science research conducted over the last 50 years. Moreover, the mental and emotional health of full-time homemakers improves significantly when they return to work outside the home. Surprisingly, working women, although they may not have a lot of time, are even healthier. Longitudinal studies conducted over a period of decades have now demonstrated that full-time homemakers suffer a considerably higher incidence of a broad range of medical problems than working women do. As the author of one study put it, it turns out that multiple roles in life are actually good for women, as they are for men. These benefits become increasingly obvious as women get older. In reporting the feminine mistake, I interviewed women all over the country, rich, poor, middle class, women with Ivy League educations and women who were high school dropouts, women with glamorous professional jobs and people who worked at McDonald's and Walmart. I interviewed women who were married, single, divorced, and widowed, who ranged in age from 17 to 80. They lived in red states and blue states. Their political views spanned the entire spectrum, as did their religious beliefs. In comparing women at different stages of family life, I found a dramatic role reversal. When their children were small, many full-time mothers felt very much needed, and they were often happy with their decision to stay home. 
At this stage, the working women felt guilty and stressed about the conflicts between jobs and family, and many of them were agonizing about whether they made the right choice. But over the next few years, the women traded places. As their children got older, the working mothers got happier. They realized that their children were turning out just fine, which relieved a lot of their guilt. As their kids became more self-sufficient, the stress of the juggling act was greatly reduced. Meanwhile, the working women's careers were flourishing and their futures looked bright. They had a high sense of self-esteem about the success they'd earned, and they were excited about the opportunities they expected to enjoy in the future. In stark contrast, the stay-at-home moms were becoming depressed and scared as they approached middle age. Their children were maturing, and the mothers no longer felt so needed and wanted. Many said their lives had lost a sense of purpose. As their kids grew more independent, their schools no longer served as the center of the mother's social lives, and they had more and more time on their hands. But when they tried to find a job, they discovered that it was unexpectedly difficult to get work that was commensurate with their abilities or that offered appropriate pay. As long as these women remained married, such problems might be limited to the emotional distress of the empty nest syndrome. But those who were divorced or widowed were also coping with the financial consequences of being on their own. Many found they could not support themselves, and the result was a drastic deterioration in their standard of living. These homemakers were often frightened and pessimistic about their futures, and many felt angry and bitter about how much it had cost them to follow the traditional female role of wife and mother. Quite a few told me that quitting their job to stay home turned out to have been the worst mistake they ever made. They couldn't understand why nobody had told them the truth about what this was likely to mean for them as time went on. But for most women, the decision to stay home is motivated by short-term considerations, and little thought is given to the long-term implications. Women in their 30s and 40s often insist that staying home was the right decision for their families, but that is far too early to make a final judgment. It takes many years, even decades, to understand fully what the consequences of opting out have been. Delivering a verdict when you're 40, or even 50, is like declaring victory when you complete the 13th mile of a 26-mile marathon. You may be do doing fine at the midway point, but you're only halfway to the finish line, and you've still got a long way to go. As one legal scholar I interviewed put it, motherhood is a temp job, and that makes it a very shaky foundation to build your life around. In America, where the average nuclear family has two children who are typically two or three years apart in age, the really intensive period of hands-on mothering lasts for 15 years or less. My own children turned 16 and 19 last month. And for me, the period when I felt really consumed by my domestic responsibilities lasted considerably less than 15 years. In the context of my entire life, that simply isn't a long period of time. I started working when I was 20, and I expect to continue well into senior citizenship. So the time when being a mother was my primary focus lasted less than 15 years out of 50 or more in my adult life alone. In the feminine mistake, I called this the 15-year paradigm, and it raises a very important question that all women need to ask themselves. Does it really make sense for us to sacrifice our own best interests over the course of five or six decades in order to relieve what turns out to be, usually, the manageable stress of juggling work and family for a relatively short period of time when your children are young? Unfortunately, in today's cultural climate, it can be dangerous even to ask such questions, let alone to answer them. The politically correct position at the moment is to treat stay-at-home motherhood as a manifestation of so-called choice feminism in which every woman's choice is supposed to be equally worthy of respect. But this isn't a question of respect. It's a question of whether a given choice works out well or badly. It doesn't matter what your political views, personal ideology, or position on the mommy wars are if you've given up your financial autonomy and something happens to your partner. 
Your opinions are irrelevant if you suddenly can't afford food and shelter for your children. But despite such risks, full-time homemakers usually remain convinced that they are doing the best thing for their children by giving up work. They often believe that working mothers are shortchanging their kids by maintaining a life outside the home, and they think their own kids will turn out better because they stayed home. And yet, the available facts simply don't support that assumption. Sociologists have, again, spent more than half a century comparing the kids of working mothers with those of full-time homemakers, trying to prove that one group does better than the other. All those decades' worth of research have consistently failed to demonstrate that the children of stay-at-home mothers do any better at all. The research on the impact of working mothers on kids shows that there isn't any, says Pamela Stone, a Hunter College sociologist who has studied the opting out phenomenon. There are many factors that do help to predict how children will turn out. The parent's consistent emotional availability is very important, for example, and poverty is a major risk factor for children. But the work status of the mother is not correlated in any way with the me mental and emotional health of the child, as far as anything we know goes. Marriage is another area in which our cultural mythology is contradicted by the actual facts. Many women quit their jobs because they believe their marriages will also do better if they devote their undivided attention to the home front. And yet, an emerging body of research suggests very different conclusions. In two career couples where both partners work outside the home and share the child care and housework, husband and wife are leading similar lives. Research on marital communication shows that people in these so-called peer marriages have more in common, more to talk about, more communication, and greater intimacy than people in conventional marriages where the husband is the breadwinner and the wife stays home. When it, women earn a significant portion of the family income, they also have more power within their marriages, and they share the decision-making more equally with their partners instead of playing a subordinate role, is, as is typically the case when the man is the only breadwinner. Despite all the stereotypes about men being threatened by women's success, my own interviews, along with studies done by many sociologists and other researchers, indicate that men increasingly want and expect women to help share the burden of earning a living. The responsibility of supporting a family often weighs very heavily on husbands who are the sole wage earner. Many men told me they were afraid to admit to their stay-at-home wives how much they resented this burden. As a result, women frequently delude themselves about the value men really place on their homemaking contributions. In recent years, surveys have shown that for the first time, younger men say they're more interested in a prospective wife's earning potential than they are in her cooking or homemaking skills. If we bring up our daughters to value homemaking above all other contributions, they are likely to find themselves increasingly out of step with men's expectations and preferences. Research also shows significant benefits for children in more egalitarian families. When children are raised by stay-at-home mothers, the boys have been shown to grow up expecting females to provide a wide range of unpaid services. <laughs> Meanwhile, the daughters of stay-at-home mothers have been shown to develop lower aspirations and fewer goals than the daughters of working mothers. When husband and wife are sharing the housework, on the other hand, the benefits for their families are striking. When fathers do housework with their children, the kids have, and listen carefully, the kids have more friends, less depression, and do better in school than children who do not do housework with their fathers. That was one of my favorite findings when I was reporting the research <laughs> for the feminine mistake. And like all the other studies I've referred to in this talk, that one is scrupulously footnoted in the book. In case any of you want to document the value of dads doing housework in future discussions with your husbands. I hope it's clear by now that all the points I've tried to cover here are drawn from extensive research. These are not my opinions. They are the findings 
of a very wide range of social scientists and other experts who have studied various aspects of this issue. The feminine mistake has been very controversial because many women erroneously assumed that I was making a value judgment about the worthiness of their choice. That is not the case. I'm a wife, a mother, and a homemaker myself. I cook dinner for my family every night, and even when I'm out of town, a homemade dinner is waiting for them in the refrigerator. I believe passionately in the value of homemaking, and I also believe that all parents, both mothers and fathers, should make their children's well-being their top priority in life. But as a reporter, my goal in taking on this issue was to close the information gap that leads so many women to make choices they later regret, simply because they didn't understand what the consequences would be. Informed choices are better than ignorant ones, and knowledge is power. Women who educate themselves about these issues generally fare much better than women who fail to anticipate the challenges that are likely to arise as time goes on. I believe that a realistic assessment of women's lives demonstrates very clearly the importance of economic empowerment. History has already shown us what happens to women who devote themselves entirely to home and family. Many of the wives who embraced the so-called feminine mystique of the 1950s had their lives shattered by the divorce revolution of the 1970s when so many of them were abandoned by the husbands they had counted on to support them. And as the philosopher George Santayana said, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. I'm not saying that you can't build a satisfying life without work. It's just hard to understand why anyone would want to settle for that. Sigmund Freud and the developmental psychologist Eric Erickson both defined work and love as the two essential components of a mature, healthy adult life. Taking responsibility for your own life in this way can be scary and difficult, but the rewards of finding meaningful work that you enjoy will help to sustain you for the rest of your life. In terms of your future happiness and security, that is much too important a goal to give up on, no matter what the obstacles might be. And it's vital for all of us to insist that men join us on this journey for the good of the entire family. In this society, raising children is all too often regarded as a women's issue. But it's not. It's a parenting issue. And it requires the increasing participation of men. In the 21st century, an egalitarian marriage in which both partners share the breadwinning as well as the child rearing and the housework offers the best protection for each individual as well as for the whole family unit. I'm sure some of you disagree, but whatever your views, it's so important for all of us to join together to create a more informed debate about these issues. I hope you'll all continue this conversation with your daughters and hopefully with your sons as well. Their future well-being may also depend on it. I thank you all for listening, and I'd be delighted to answer your questions. Do you have me? Okay. Um, we don't have too much time, but, you know, since Leslie is a controversial writer, I would like to see if anyone has any questions, which I'm going to guess the room definitely does. Anybody? Yes. Uh, sort of. I'm not sure that's on. Yesterday I was driving home and I was listening to XM radio and it was Dr. Laura. Oh. <laughs> um, she made a statement that completely flipped me out. She basically said, um, the right thing to do is to stay home with your children. And I have a two-year-old and a business. I was so taken aback because I struggle with that. Yeah. Um, how do you Do respond to something I, like that? I have several things to say about Dr. Laura, <laughs> whom I know all too well. I've been a reporter for 
38 years. She is possibly the single worst person I've ever met in my entire professional career. And I say that for this reason. I was assigned to do a Vanity Fair profile of her some years ago, and I started getting calls all over the country from people who told me the vicious things she had done to try to destroy other people's careers in order to pave the way for her own. She took away another woman's husband. The father of her child was married to somebody else and had several kids when she started having an affair with him. And I could go on and on about the truth about her life. She was building a career and a company that she sold for $70 million. She was doing her radio show. She was churning out bestsellers. She was never home while she gets on the uh, radio every day and tells 27 million people all around the country that women should stay home. She is telling them what to do in a way that she has never done herself. Her husband, whom I also know, is the one who makes dinner and puts it on the table every night. Now, this is just the most egregious hypocrisy. Dr. Laura is entitled to her opinion. Um, you know, she defines herself for her radio audience as somebody whose primary identity is as her son's mom. But this is not the reality of her life. It is entirely her public facade. It bears absolutely no relationship to the reality of her life. And I'm really sick of women being terrorized by these judgmental people who preach things that they really don't live up to. Dr. Laura understood very well that she was going to have to figure out a way to support herself, and she has done so brilliantly. She's been incredibly successful. But she puts women in a dreadful situation when she reinforces this unfair guilt that women are made to feel about doing something that is only sensible. I mean, I just, you know, a, a, a parent's first, nobody makes you have kids, you know, uh, in this era. A parent's first responsibility is to provide food and shelter for their children. And telling women to voluntarily put themselves in a situation where they're unprepared to do that um, absolutely makes no sense in this century because we just don't have the social safety net that will support women if something happens. So uh, what I have to say about Dr. Laura is that this is a really vicious thing to do to women, totally unfair, and because she's such a hypocrite and I documented that incredibly extensively in Vanity Fair a few years ago, if any of you want to look it up. Uh, I don't see why any woman should waste any energy worrying at all about what she has to say. Liz. I mean, she gets up there and calls women sluts, you know, she insults them, you know, this is just a horrible way to behave in the world. We have a question back here. Hi, over here. Hi. Um, can you see me? I'm on the side. <laughs> way over here. <laughs> the light's in my way. Oh, okay. Um, my question is, well, I had a comment first is um, in regards to sign. Um, earlier in the panel, we were talking about signs. Well, I feel like this has been a sign for me. Um, but I have been a stay-at-home mom for three years. My husband lost his job in October last year, uh, along with 900 other people <laughs> with the company. Um, he was with the company for 12 years. I have an interview tomorrow. Um, my husband's still out of a job. He's been looking for five months now, six months. And one of the questions that I am very afraid to answer, and I know they're going to ask, is what have you been doing for the past three years? Um, yeah. How do I answer that? Uh, you know, I, there are a lot of people out there who are self-appointed experts on, you know, how women should get back in the labor force after a timeout. As far as I can tell, most of the people who write the books about this stuff are women who have failed to do it and uh, uh, having failed say, oh, I'll write a book about it. Um, I won't name any names. But, and I don't claim that I'm an expert, but what I can tell you, I'm a reporter. That's all I am. I collect information. I'm happy to pass it along. What I do find is that um, you just wouldn't believe the amount of prejudice out there about women in the, in the labor force, about women who have taken a time out. It is virulent. And don't kid yourselves. Don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't exist because it does. The men do not value what women do at home. They don't understand it. They don't think about it. They want somebody else to take care of it. And they certainly don't want to hear what you've been doing at home. They may ask you, but they don't want to hear about it. But even more surprising is the women, the female employers, most of whom have been juggling work and family all these years. And they, in the interviews that I did, expressed the most hostility towards stay-at-home mothers. Um, they said really shocking things. 
because uh, they viewed them, one of them said, I think they're self-indulgent and lazy. Understand that this is what you're up against. My personal recommendation would be, don't talk about what you're doing at home. Uh, don't give your excuses or your reasons for why, you know, your justifications for why you left the labor force, because then that permits somebody else to pass judgment on what your reasons were. Just say, I made a decision to stay home, I had family issues to take care of, and leave it at that, because then nobody can pick apart your reasons and, you know, pass judgment on you and dismiss you. The focus should be on what you're able to offer them in the future, what you're interested in doing to make your own life more um, uh, rewarding and more secure, and what you can offer to the company. So my personal advice would be stay away from that topic as much as you possibly can. For those of you who are not planning on going back immediately, whose husbands remain currently employed, as the recession gets worse every day, um, I would say that uh, it is wise to find something that, you know, even if you're doing volunteer work, target it to either the field that you were in before or a field that you'd like to go back to so you will have something that is professional to talk about. Um, I, one of the lawyers that I profiled in my book had left her field and she had been doing some pro bono work on uh, immigration, which was not even her area of expertise. But she was interested in it, so she got a grant and wrote a manual on uh, immigration law. And she was not thinking about reentry uh, for the workforce. But when it was time for her to come back and the employers asked her that question, what have you been doing while you were out, she realized she could hand them this thing. And it was a piece of work that was solid and connected to her field, and it got her a fabulous job. She attributes her reentry solely to the fact that just by accident, she had done something that turned out to be professionally relevant, even though, as I said, it wasn't even her field of expertise. So those of you who still feel that you have a few years ahead of you at home, try to think along those lines. And, um, you know, the school, running the school bake sale is not going to get you any place in the workforce. Um, but doing something, you know, that is um, targeted to possible future paid employment may help you a lot. I, I want to interject here. One of the reasons why we brought Leslie here is because the parallel between what she's saying and what we offer is, is pretty obvious, right? What we offer is an opportunity to keep your skills fresh for whatever that period of time is for you, whether you're opting down, not out, you know, trying to take a 20-hour work week position versus a 60-hour work week position, or whether you're trying to come back in ways that you can bring yourself in slowly. So that is what the Mom Corps is all about, maintaining the ability, maintaining your economic, what did she call it, economic empowerment um, throughout the periods of time where your life is in flux and changes. And so I think that's a pretty strong parallel because if you do that over a period of time, you'll be in less of a situation where you're having to explain a very large gap on your resume. Do we have time for those? Can Yes. Hi. Um, Good luck tomorrow. And I, uh, my advice to you and to all here is, in my experience, I, um, I was able to craft my own fl flexible arrangement. But uh, you know, I, I just I think the main thing that was talked about earlier is the confidence to just ask. There's research that you didn't mention about women in the workplace who don't ask. They they take less money. There's even going a book in. called Women Don't. Yeah, ask. women don't ask. They take less money going in. They don't negotiate. They don't ask for raises. They don't ask for promotions. So I know that uh, I still struggle with it, but having the confidence to, to ask and to also say, I've written my own job description five times since I've been working for seven years, to continually craft it in a way that takes account for what the corporation needs, but also what I can give and what I need in my life. So you, you also have to be creative and constantly, um, and also be, be protective of that, and yes, you will get critiqued, I'm in a family-friendly environment. That helps because not only the men, not only the women, but the men are also seeking to put their family first. But I would just encourage you to go in with confidence, to really spend all the time thinking about all your successes. There's lots of transferable skills that we use in our volunteer work and, and elsewhere that we can go in confidently and have something great to offer. So good luck. I think, um, you know, I want to also say, for those of you who were here last year, we had Jean Chatsky here who talked about owning your finances, some of the concepts not too dissimilar from, from what we've discussed today. And, um, 
you know, what Jean says, you know, she's a financial analyst. She's a, you know, contributing editor for Money, Ma writer for Money Magazine. She's on Oprah. She's, um, and she too was going through a divorce, and she said she hadn't paid enough attention to her own finances. And she was pretty raw with us last year to say, ladies, go home and get involved in your finances, so you're not all of a sudden looking up in the middle of a divorce, not knowing how to log into your stock plan. Or not even just a divorce. I mean, I cannot begin to tell you. I have interviewed thousands of women over the years. I have interviewed women whose husbands got struck by lightning, who were sliced apart by helicopter rotor blades, who were killed in car accidents, who were killed in plane crashes. I mean, you name it, there is, there is nothing that can't happen to you in the world. Um, you know, and which you learn over time as a reporter, you just can't believe the stuff you hear. So even if your husband is the greatest guy in the world, that is really not, the, the discussion can't end there because um, uh, Katha Pollitt, who's a, a, a writer, just recently wrote a collection of essays called Learning to Drive, and there's one of the essays in it is called When All the Men Are Dead. And I'm old enough, I'm older than you guys, I'm old enough to know that you get, you know, you start getting older and the, the guys are dropping like flies. You can have had the best <laughs> husband in the world. But, you know, if you were married for 25 years, you know, one of my closest friends um, I quoted in the book, when she was first starting her career 30 years ago, her mother was 57 and had just been widowed and uh, had no idea of how to get a job but decided she wanted one. And she called her daughter and said, who was like 22, and said, can you get me a job? And her daughter had to say, no, I can't. Forty, almost 40 years have passed since that day. Her mother is alive well into her 90s. She has spent the last 40 years being bored, restless, empty, and unfulfilled, as well as alone because she, she lost her husband in her 50s. Virtually every uh, event that I do, and I spent the last year on the road talking about these issues, I find myself at some point surrounded by women in their 50s. The other day I was at an event, and there were like 10 women in their 50s around me. Every single one of them had been widowed. Every single one of them had a mother in her 90s. One of them said to me, uh, my mother just turned 100. That is the future, and we have to plan for it. All right, I think we have time for one last question. And if, April, you're somewhere, are you giving? Thanks. Um, I hear all the financial stuff, and it's great because it makes me feel better. But um, I just had my best friend quit her job, and I get emails all the time about why quitting her job makes her kids better. How old is she? My friend. She's 34 now. Everybody believes it at 34. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I guess my and my mother-in-law was a stay-at-home mom, so I get it all the time. Yeah, and I I, I can imagine everybody here gets it. Uh huh. So my question to you is, outside of the financial, like my hopes are that my girls grow up and go, wow, she was a great mom. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a story from you? <laughs> can you help from me your out? experience that would do yeah. that? Yeah, you know, I mean. I, it's always very hard to talk about these issues because I, you know, you're trying to make generalizations about large populations of people. And, you know, when you're talking about research findings and so on, you're talking about the conclusions drawn from large populations of people. And I don't mean to diss any one individual person, you know. I mean, uh, there's nothing that's more valuable than trying to be a good mother. If you've taken the responsibility of bringing a child into the world, I think there's just absolutely nothing more important. But the research shows what the experience of an awful lot of people that I've talked to reflects, which is that as kids get older, um, they don't respect, I mean, they, they reflect the values of this culture. Uh, one of the stay-at-home mothers I interviewed was really devastating, was devastated. Her husband was a hedge fund manager, and she had gotten a law degree and never practiced, and she felt that the deal was he was going to be rich and she was going to take care of everything else. Well, guess what? He just lost all the money in the hedge fund. And they don't have the money. And her daughter, she has two teenage daughters. One of them was like 13 and one of them was 15. And her daughters are, you know, I mean, these kids are obviously really spoiled and, whoa, and have problematic values. But the things she quoted to me that her daughters had said to her were so vicious, like, what good are you? We don't have money and you can't buy me a juicy t-shirt, you know. Why don't you have a career, you know, you're just not worth anything if you can't, you know, help to support this family, that kind of thing. Um, and these were, 
such shocking and deeply wounding things. Now, hopefully most kids, um, you know, have better values than that if we've brought them up right, and they're also kinder and more compassionate than that. But I got to tell you, I was talking to a man the other day who just got um, out of business school, and he was really excited because he had just won a fellowship, a very prestigious fellowship, that really, really would have started him on the career he wanted. But his mother, his 57-year-old mother, just got left by her third husband and has no means of support and no money. And he said very bitterly, I am going to have to change my entire career plan because my mother has never taken any responsibility for supporting herself. She always thought there would be some man around to do it. She's gone through three husbands, but she's probably not going to get another husband now. And I'm an only child, and it's all on me. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life supporting my mother and making my decisions uh, based on that. i got to tell you, the adult children of full-time mothers do not end up thanking you for bringing homemade cupcakes to the bake sale if they are supporting you and at a time when they want to be saving for their first home or to get married or, st or to start their own lives, they have the burden of a mother who just never took responsibility for this stuff. So I guess the bottom line of a lot of what I would say to you guys is there's a tremendous amount of cultural propaganda out there that's all aimed at making women feel bad. You cannot pick up a women's magazine without being told, you know, you should lose 10 pounds or you should firm your thighs or you should do this or you should do that. And the cultural propaganda is the same thing, whether it comes from Dr. Laura or your mother-in-law. Um, but women really have not grappled with how different the economic and actuarial as well as social realities of the 21st century are from the 20th century. We are in a very different world. We've all got to inform ourselves about what that is going to mean for us and our daughters, and we've all got to prepare for it. So I would say the bottom line is take the long view. Don't make these short-term decisions that may seem right at the time. It's all very well when you're 34 to say, oh, yeah, you know, it's important to me to be a good snack mom, you know, um, every Tuesday and Thursday at the elementary school. But I have not made, I mean, I've talked to thousands of women just this year since doing the book. I have not made one appearance that older women didn't come up to me and say, you know, I was married for 25 years, I was married for 30 years, I'm now widowed, I'm divorced, and I'm impoverished, and I don't know what to do. Don't let that happen to you. Thank you, Leslie. I think we're done with it.